We all rely on our phones or car navigation to get us from A to B. But have you ever wondered how that little blue dot actually knows where you are? Let's dive into the fascinating world of GPS and find out how satellites in space help us navigate the Earth with almost pinpoint accuracy. First things first, GPS stands for Global Positioning System, and it's basically a network of at least 24 satellites orbiting Earth. Each satellite constantly sends out a signal with its position and the time the signal was sent. Think of them as cosmic timekeepers, each one shouting out its location to the world every second. Now, here's where the magic happens. Your phone or car, GPS, receives these signals from at least four different satellites and uses some clever math called trilateration to figure out exactly where you are. By comparing how long each signal takes to reach you, your device calculates your distance from each satellite. Kind of like playing a cosmic game of Marco Polo, only with atomic clocks instead of kids in a pool. Speaking of atomic clocks, these satellites are equipped with some of the most precise timekeepers ever built. Why? Because even the tiniest error, a few billionths of a second, could throw off your location by hundreds of meters. Imagine your pizza delivery showing up in the wrong city. And here's the real mind bender. Those satellites are moving at around 14,000 kilometers per hour, and they're way up in orbit, so time actually moves differently for them than it does for us down here on Earth. Thanks to Einstein's theory of relativity, engineers had to factor in these time differences. Otherwise, your GPS would be worse than a paper map in a hurricane. Modern GPS is so precise that it can pinpoint your location within a few meters. That's why you can find your friend's house, avoid traffic jams, or even catch a Pokemon without getting hopelessly lost. Fun fact, GPS was originally designed for the US military in the 1970s, but it's now used by everyone from farmers and hikers to pilots and pizza delivery drivers. And while we often take it for granted, it's one of the most sophisticated pieces of technology humanity has ever built, all thanks to satellites, atomic clocks, and some seriously mind-boggling math. So next time you're following that blue dot on your screen, remember it's powered by space-age science, Einstein's relativity, and a global team of satellites working together just to help you get to the nearest coffee shop without making a wrong turn. Let me ask you something. When you hear black box, what do you imagine? A mysterious cube full of secrets, something used in spy thrillers, or maybe that one drawer in your kitchen full of charges from 2007? Well, get ready, because airplane black boxes are neither mysterious nor black. They're orange, bright orange, like a uh, construction cone meets emergency flare orange. Why? Because in the event of a crash, you want that thing to be found not playing hide-and-seek with search teams in the Himalayas, but the name stuck. Probably because flight recorder safety module sounds like a rejected IKEA product. And so, what is a black box, really? It's actually two devices bundled into one rugged, high-tech container. The cockpit voice recorder, or CVR, the flight data recorder, or FDR, Together, they're the plane's memory, and no, uh, unlike your ex, they don't forget anything. Let's break it down. The flight data recorder is like a super nerdy stalker for your plane. It tracks over 80 different parameters, speed, altitude, heading, engine performance, autopilot status, flat positions, coffee temperature, okay, maybe not that last one. And it keeps the last 25 hours of flight history like a very, very nosy time machine. The cockpit voice recorder, on the other hand, is your audio detective. It records everything the pilots say, from landing gear down to, did you see that bird, uh, to oops, 
even cabin crew intercom calls and the subtle sighs of despair when someone says, let's turn off autopilot and go manual. Now let's talk durability, because these little orange tanks are built to survive almost anything short of being swallowed by a black hole. They can withstand fires hotter than lava over 1,100 degrees Celsius, impact forces of over 3,400 Gs. That's like being punched by a planet ocean pressure at depths of 6,000 meters. They're sealed tighter than grandma's Christmas cookies and protected by titanium or stainless steel. And they come with an underwater beacon a pinging uh, device that activates upon contact with water and keeps broadcasting for 30 days. If the wreck is underwater, rescuers have a fighting chance to find the box, even if your luggage is now somewhere near Atlantis. And guess what? The first black box wasn't American or German or Japanese. It was Australian, invented by a scientist named Dr. David Warren, who thought, Maybe instead of guessing what happened in a crash, we should just record it. Genius. And here's the twist. When he pitched the idea, no one wanted it. Airlines said it would be too expensive. Pilots thought it was intrusive. Governments didn't get it. But after a few high-profile disasters, the world finally went, oh, maybe that recording thing isn't such a bad idea after all. Today, black boxes are standard in a and they've helped solve hundreds of investigations. They've changed how planes are built, how pilots are trained, and how aviation safety is enforced. So next time you board a plane, take a moment to think about the little orange box quietly tucked in the tail. It's not just a piece of tech, it's a silent guardian, a metal memoir, and hey, if you like, uncovering unexpected facts about the world around you from banana curves to black boxes. Subscribe to Factodo and never miss a story that blows your mind. We've got a seatbelt free ticket to curiosity every single week. Let's pop the bonnet, shall we? No, not your nan's fancy headwear, the bonnet of a car. Because today we're diving into the inner workings of one of the most efficient, powerful and delightfully noisy inventions ever made, the diesel engine. So how does it work? Well, unlike a petrol engine, a diesel engine doesn't use spark plugs to ignite the fuel. Nope. Diesel engines are a bit tougher than that. They rely on one of the most underrated forces in the universe, pressure, and not the emotional kind, although a bad MOT will give you that too. Here's the breakdown. The diesel engine operates on something called the four-stroke cycle. It sounds like an awkward dance move, but, but it's really the secret behind how your lorry holds 20 tons of bricks without breaking a sweat. Step one, intake. Air is sucked into the cylinder as the piston moves down. Just air, no fuel yet, kind of like a big mechanical inhale. Step two, compression. The piston shoots back up, compressing the air until it's hotter than your phone after five hours of candy crush. We're talking really hot. Around 500 degrees Celsius. Why? Because when the air's that hot, it can ignite fuel all on its own. No spark needed. Just sheer heat and fury. Step three, power. Now comes the magic. Diesel fuel is injected straight into the hot, compressed air, and boom, controlled explosion. The force of that explosion pushes the piston down, creating the power that turns the crankshaft, spins the wheels, and gets you to B and Q before it shuts. Step four, exhaust. The piston comes back up again and pushes the spent gases out through the exhaust valve. That's the engine exhaling and then it all starts again, hundreds of times a minute. Now, what makes diesel engines special? Well, for starters, diesel fuel contains more energy per liter than petrol, and because of the way it's burned under high pressure and temperature, diesel engines are more efficient and last longer.
That's why you'll find them in buses, lorries, tractors, and the occasional very smug estate car. But they do have downsides. They're louder. They produce more nitrogen oxides. And yes, they've been at the center of a few environmental scandals we won't mention by name, <laughs> Volkswagen. Still, the diesel engine is a masterpiece of engineering. It's robust, reliable, and can run for half a million miles if you don't treat it like a rental. So next time you hear that low growling rumble on the motorway, tip your invisible cap to the diesel engine, nun. The beast under the bonnet that keeps the world moving. You're enjoying an ice cream, life is good. Then, bam, it hits you. The Arctic blast to the skull. A frozen thunderbolt from dessert hell. Congratulations, you've just experienced a brain freeze, but why? Why does something so sweet hurt so bad? Is it karma for eating the entire tub in one sitting? Maybe, but science has a slightly different explanation. Let's start with the basics. Brain freeze, or if you're feeling fancy, sphenopalatine ganglia neuralgia is a rapid onset headache that happens when something cold touches the roof of your mouth. It's like your brain screaming, whoa, too cold, mate. Except it's not really your brain that's cold. It's your mouth tricking your head. Here's how it works. The roof of your mouth, also known as the hard palate, is loaded with sensitive blood vessels. When you inhale a milkshake like it's oxygen, that cold hits fast those blood vessels rapidly constrict, then expand just as quickly as your body tries to regulate the sudden temperature change. This sets off a chain reaction. The trigeminal nerve, a big player in your face's pain drama, gets confused. It thinks the pain is coming from your forehead, not your mouth. Boom. Instant forehead ice pick. It's basically your body being too efficient. Pain signals go flying to your brain like a panicked intern yelling, something's wrong, and your brain responds with a big old headache, even though your head's perfectly fine. Now, how do you stop it? Step one, don't eat ice cream like a vacuum cleaner. Take smaller bites, let it melt a little, show some restraint. Hard, I know. Step two, warm the roof of your mouth. Press your tongue up there, drink warm water, or just groan dramatically, purely for effect. Bonus tip, brain freeze isn't dangerous. It just makes you look ridiculous mid-cone, clutching your forehead like you just had an epiphany. But hey, now you've got a science fact for the next time you and your ice cream need some space. Subscribe for more tasty science daily trivia, and painful truths about dessert. Because nothing says educational content like suffering through a Sunday. Have you ever sat in a movie theater, put on those funny plastic glasses, and wondered, how on earth do these things make the film look like it's leaping off the screen? Well, buckle up. Because today we're diving into the eye-popping world of 3D glasses. It all starts with your eyes. Yes, those two squishy orbs that let you see the world in three dimensions. Normally, each eye gets a slightly different angle on things, and your brain cleverly merges those two images into one, giving you depth perception. That's why you don't walk into doors most of the time anyway. But when it comes to 3D movies, filmmakers have to trick your eyes into thinking that flat image on the screen actually has depth. Enter 3D glasses, the magical goggles that transform an ordinary movie into an immersive experience. One common method uses polarized light. In simple terms, they film the movie with two cameras, each capturing a slightly different angle. Then at the cinema, the projector shows both images on the screen at the same time, but each is polarized differently, one horizontally and one vertically. The lenses of your 3D glasses filter the light so that each eye only sees one of the images. Your brain does the rest, and suddenly that spaceship 
is flying right at you. Another old school trick uses colored lenses, usually red and blue. Ever see those cheap cardboard glasses? Yeah, those. Each lens blocks out a specific color and each eye only sees one of the two images on the screen. It's a bit less fancy than polarization, but it still gets the job done. Though, let's be honest, you look like a time traveler from the 80s with those things on. 3D technology has come a long way since the days of paper glasses and headaches. Modern 3D systems often use high-tech polarization and even active shutter glasses that sync with the screen. Some theaters even throw in vibrating seats for extra immersion because who doesn't want a mini earthquake with their popcorn? And here's a fun fact. Even in the age of VR and AR, 3D movies still have a place in our hearts. They let us escape reality for a while. And let's be honest, who doesn't want to dodge a T-Rex in the comfort of their seat? So next time you're at the movies and that dinosaur seems to leap from the screen, remember? It's all thanks to a bit of optical trickery and your amazing brain. Now, if only those glasses made the popcorn taste better too,